Okay, perfect. Everyone is being recorded and transcribed. So, well, let's see. Yep, the class. No, I think this class is very important. I said this earlier. It's very important. These concepts like like uh, Ohm's law and voltage division for sure. I don't know if Dr. Colton told you the story about like the recruiter who said that they're never coming back to UTD because they interviewed a student one time and they didn't know voltage division. So they said, if you don't teach them voltage division, then we're never going to recruit from UTD again. And I don't know if she was lying or not, but it definitely is one of those things that like, okay, yeah. if uh, if you go to an interview and you don't know how to do voltage division, that doesn't speak well to your performance on real things. That's like, that's like addition and you're applying to be a mathematician. So let's let's get into this. OK, so welcome everyone online as well. Uh, if people are joining in as we go, that's OK. This is recorded. So the first thing that we're going to go over is nodes in a circuit and counting nodes and understanding nodes. So you probably learned this last semester as well, but. Nodes are a region of a circuit that can be reached without jumping over any component. And every point in the nose has this node has the same voltage. And you might have many currents coming in or exiting the node. So if we if I give you this circuit right here, can anyone tell me how many nodes there are? Right. Four nodes, which are, what are they? So be from B1 to R1 and then to you're talking about this is one. This is another. <laughs> right, there's three nodes. There's three nodes. So they are, let me see if I can highlight here. So this is all one node. This is all one node. And this is all one node. So step one is being able to just recognize what the nodes are and where they are, how many there are. So I could tell you or you could tell me that the voltage at. If we were to measure the voltage right here at this, the top of R2, that's the same as the voltage at this point and the same as the voltage at this point and right here as well. They're all on the same nodes. So they have the same voltage. Now, one of the interesting spots we have here is let's call this node A. This is B and C, right? So there's nodes and then there's also branches. So node B has basically one path coming into it here. Another path coming into it there and one path exiting there. So this is spoiling a little bit, but we know from KCL, what can we say about those currents? If we call this I1, I2, and I3, does anyone know how we could mathematically relate these three currents? Exactly, yeah. That's KCL. We know that the current flowing in has to equal the current flowing out, or the sum of all currents it has to equal zero, however you want to form it, formulate it. But OK, let's do another example. How many nodes does this circuit have? One, two. It's one. It's kind of a trick question, isn't it? Yeah. So because we have this short here, that's saying that this bit is in the same node as this bit. This is all the same node. This is all the same node. There's just one node. So this is not good in, in real life because this 10 volts would be shorted. Um, so what that looks like is we know from Ohm's law, V equals I R. Voltage is 10 volts. We don't know current. We know that the resistance of a wire is very, very, very small. So let's call this like 0 0.0001 ohms. That's going to be a lot of current. So that's why you don't short a battery. But yeah, this is one node. So don't ever get tricked by that. If something is shorted, that means that the top and the bottom of it, both sides of it, are connected to the same node. And that, that we would say that, that that device is shorted. So if a resistor is shorted, it's as if it's not there. OK. Let's go on Ohm's law. So Ohm's law, right? B equals I R. The voltage across a component is equal to the current times the resistance of the component. And we know for resistors, resistors are, are probably the easiest one. Resistors always dissipate power. So 
So I don't know how much you guys have talked about power. Have you talked about power a little bit? OK, so resistors always dissipate power as heat, which means that if you have a positive voltage drop across the resistor, then you're going to be having current flow from the, the high end to the low end. It's always going to happen like that for a resistor. Um, voltage is higher on the incoming current side and lower on the outgoing current side. So you've probably seen like the, the, the power equations. So power is equals to current times voltage. And if we know that voltage is voltage is current times resistance, V equals I, or this is Ohm's law. Right? So we can derive these other power formulas by just substituting these two equations with each other. But these are all the same thing basically for a resistor. Power is equal to I times V or I squared R or V squared over R. And if you forget these formulas, you can always rederive them. So for example, P equals IV, V equals IR. If we plug this V in right there, then we get P equals I times this V is now IR. I times I times R is I squared R. And that's power. That's the second equation. You can do the same thing if you if you um, divide the resistance over to the other side and you get I equals V over R. And then you get P equals IV. Plug this I there, you get V over R times V is V squared over R. So if you if you know how to manipulate these two equations, you can get to all of these formulas. It's not that big of a deal, but you might be asked questions about power dissipation. And we'll talk more about it in a bit. But Ohm's law uh, is, is pretty, pretty simple. Does anyone have any questions about Ohm's law? Let's move on. There's definitely more complicated things to talk about on this exam. So resistors, equivalent resistance. Again, something you should probably have seen in last semester as well. If you combine resistors in series, you add them up to get an equivalent resistance. And in any circuit, you can always replace multiple resistors with their equivalent resistance, and it should work out just fine. If they're in parallel, they add inversely. So one over the equivalent resistance is equal to the sum of the inverses of the individual resistances. And you have to make sure that you know that two things are in parallel if and only if each of the two sides are the same two notes. So for example, if you have like this is all one node, this is all one node, and each of the resistors are between those two nodes and they're in parallel. Um, sometimes, sometimes something looks like it's in parallel, but it's not. Um, so you just have to make sure that you understand uh, by labeling the nodes, sometimes that helps. A and B, so R3 is between A and B, R2 is between A and B that in parallel. So the the formula for resistors in parallel, you've probably seen this is uh, is uh, the product over sum. So you can say R1 times R2 over R1 plus R2, and that's uh, two resistors in parallel. So you can derive that again by using this formula, by basically multiplying out and getting common denominators and finding it's the same thing, but the product over sum formula is really easy to remember. Um, so if, if you're given two resistors, let's say you have, this is a 1K and this is a 5K, right? Uh, you could do the equivalent resistance, these two in parallel is 1,000 times 5,000 over 1,000 plus 5,000 is 6,000 which is 5 times 10 to the 6th over 6 times 10 to the 3. We can do some division. That's 1,000. That's 1,000, which is 5,000 over 6, which will simplify some number. Um, that's not super important, but you can use this product over some formula. Or sometimes what I like to do on my calculator, um, especially if you have more than two resistors, is you know that 1 over R EQ equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus all the other ones, 1 over Rn. So if you flip both of these, then you can get R EQ equals 1 over 1 over R1 Right? These are equivalent. And so when you're using a calculator, sometimes it's nice to use the second form, because then you can 
just type it in, you'll get your answer. You don't have to remember to flip it at the end. So what I this, this is how I sometimes write things, and you'll see this later on as I write it like this. Um, and just just know that these are the same things. This we're solving directly for the equivalent resistance, and here we're solving for the inverse of it. But all it is is, is flipping this entire thing. OK, any questions about resistors in parallel and series? This is, again, probably something you've seen before. Yeah. Is there any way you could do one of those drift operations? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll get to some. I think I have a couple in here. If not, let's uh, we can we can build one, actually. So. So let, let's just draw some some resistors out. Actually, I had. A, no, I was going to take too long. Let's just uh, let's draw. Okay, let's say that this is a 10 volt source. Okay. We have one resistor. OK, and let's call this one. 100. I'm just not going to write the ohms because we don't have time for that. One K. OK, so this is like a, a pretty wacky resistor network, but we can use our rules of parallel and series resistors to simplify it, right? So does anyone know what step one is? Anyone see what we can do? Yes. Right. And that's a good that's a good observation, because even though they don't look exactly like they're literally parallel lines, they are in between the same same two nodes. Usually you're not going to see things at an angle like this, but sometimes you will, and it's good to know. So step one, we can combine these two are in parallel. And and one uh, notation thing that you've probably seen is you can write like uh, the 1K one K is in parallel with the 1.2K. Right, so this just means parallel. OK, but um, anything else that we can do on this step? Put the resistors in series there, the 500 or 300. Yeah, so we can combine. That's not a good color. OK, we can combine these two in series, right? So let's let's just do that real quick. And redraw our circuit. So we've got our 10 volt source, 100. 50, 100. Okay, now 500 plus 300 is 800. All right. And then now we have a 1K and a 1.2K. What does that make? Well, we can use our product over sum formula. Or sometimes, sometimes if you're given um, a lot of these things, it could be nice to just solve it all symbolically first and then type it in. Sometimes it's nice to simplify as we go. So let's simplify as we go. So 1K and a 1.2K, that is 1,000. Everyone agree? 1K is 1,000, 1.2K is 1,200. So this would be, they don't have their calculators out. 545. Okay, I'll just I'll just do that. Yeah, okay. Um, and we can do a gut check quick because this is a pattern you might have seen before. If you have two resistors in parallel that have the same value, what happens to them? So that's a 1K. It's half, yeah. 
So since 1K is about 1.2K, we know that the answer should be roughly half of those two. 545 is about half, so that makes sense. Okay, so we've got our 800, and we can re replace those two with the 545, and then we have our 5K. Okay, apologize for the poor drawing, but here's where we're at. Now, the next step. Okay, so we add the 5K and the 545, and then what will we do after that? In series with these two, yeah. Okay, so let's let's kind of uh, do our roadmap here. So we have 545 plus 5K, <laughs> right? So that's going to be these two resistors on the end, and that's going to be in parallel with the 800. That's going to be in parallel with the 250. Okay, and then this whole thing basically represents the entire network that exists between here and here, right? It's these two combining, and then this pair combining with this one and this one. So this whole network is represented by these brackets. And then this, this whole network is in series with a 100 and a 100. Does everyone see that? If we were able to reduce this, collapse this down to a single resistor, it would be 100 plus that plus 100. All right? So plus 100 plus 100. Okay? So this is 5,545 5, in parallel with 800 in parallel with 250. Let's work on that. Okay? So here we could, we could type it in. If anyone gets it faster than me, then you can just shout it out. One hundred eighty four. About. OK, we'll just we'll just drop off decimal points, but everyone agrees with this. OK, and then that so we can redraw our network now. It's 10 volts plus minus. We have 100 ohm resistor. What amounts to a 184 ohm resistor? And a 100 ohm resistor. Right. So what this means is that we can add these in series. So the total combined resistance as seen by this source is how much? Yeah, the sum summation of these 100 plus 184 plus 100 is 384 ohms. OK, so how much current is being drawn from the source? How do we solve that? Right, Ohm's law basically, right? So we have V equals I R. We know the V is 10 volts. We don't know the I, but the R is 384 ohms, right? Because this this will simplify down to basically a single 10 volt source and a 384 ohm resistor. And it's all identical as seen by the source. So if, if we if we were given this network, it's very easy to find the current. We just use Ohm's law and we say that the I is equal to 10 volts over 384 ohms, which is. 0 0.026. Amps or that's 26 milliamps. OK, so then we can also calculate the power. How do we calculate the power? Voltage times current, yeah. So power equals V times I, which is 10 volts times 26 milliamps, or which is 10 volts times, maybe this is easier, 0 0.026 amps, which is 0 0.26 watts, right? Now. If we had, instead of finding the current, we used one of our other formulas. Um, does anyone know the, the, the formula for using uh, voltage and resistance? How do, you, how do you get power using voltage and resistance? V squared over R. V squared over R, OK? V squared over R, which is 10 volts squared divided by 384. And let's type that in. Do we get the same thing? 260 or 0.26 watts or 
260 million watts. So that's a good gut check that we got the same answers either way. Um, you'll probably you might see something like this on your exam where you simplify a network and then you're asked for the current. Uh, any any questions on this? Yeah, the steps for simplifying. Um, it can be kind of tricky sometimes like this one wasn't that bad, but make sure that you're checking if something is in parallel. That's that's where you'll get caught up on these questions is if if uh, two resistors don't look like they're in parallel, but they actually are um, check for that because they're not going to ask you. There are more complicated ways to connect resistors, but they're not going to be covered in this class. Um, so so there's definitely going to be a parallel and series way to, to collapse these resistor networks. OK, and we can do more examples of this uh, later if we want to. Um, KCL and KVL. So these are uh, very helpful for circuit analysis. KCL, the net current for any node is zero, which means the current entering has to be equal to the current leaving or the current entering minus the current leaving is equal to zero. They're all saying the same thing. The sum of all the currents, um, polarized currents is zero. OK, so let's do this quick question. What is the current through R7 and what's the current through R8? So basically, this is just a simplified schematic. There's some some other part of the network over here, some other part of the network over here. We know that we have this node. At this node, we have. Oh, let, let's write KCL for that. OK, so sometimes uh, it's helpful to guess the polarity of resistors. So put assign your pluses and your minuses. And then. That way, you know which direction the current's going to flow. Now you might be wrong, but if you're wrong, the only thing that's going to happen is you're going to get a negative current. Have you guys encountered this before? Or sometimes you say, oh, current's going to flow this way. It's negative four amps. Well, that means it's just four amps flowing the other way. So it's really not a bad idea to just guess. Um, and it's fine. Just don't get confused with your polarity and just stay consistent. So for a resistor, current is always going to flow from the positive to the negative side. Let's call this I7. And let's call this I8. OK, so we know from KCL that I1 uh we i1 is coming into this node and i7 and i8 are leaving so we can say i1 equals i7 plus i8 okay so that's the kcl equation for this node now how are we going to solve this well we know that i1 is equal to 600 milliamps how do we get i7 then we know how to get i7 ohm's law. ohm's law right so this is really convenient because we know that the voltage of this node is 30 volts, and down here, this is a ground symbol. So ground has a potential of zero volts. So we know that the voltage across this resistor, let's let's go here. So um, the voltage across the resistor is 30 volts minus zero volts. And that's equal to I times R, OK? Um, so a lot of times what we do is to find the current is voltage divided by resistance. So we're going to divide it by R on both sides. So the current I7 equals 30 volts minus 0 volts over 350 ohms. OK, so what is I7? 30 divided by 350. 0.086. Let's call it that 0 0.086 six amps okay so 600 milliamps equals 0 0.086 i guess we can call it 86 milliamps plus i8 how do we find i8 exactly right we, we didn't need to solve all three of these to to use kcl we just needed all but one so we have our equation now 600 milliamps is coming in we know that 86 milliamps is coming down this way. So that leaves the remaining, whatever that is, 514. Say uh, I8 plus 86 milliamps equals 600 milliamps. We subtract the 86 from both sides. And we get that I8 equals I think they did that math, right? So I8 is 514 milliamps. So in that way, we solved both of those using KCL. And then from there, maybe they'll ask you what's the power that's 
um, being dissipated by R7. But if you know the current and you know the resistance, then you can use which equation? Yeah, I squared R, I squared R for, for um, current and resistance. And again, you could use the voltage drop because we know the voltage drop is 30. Um, so there's there's multiple ways you could do it, but this is KCL. Uh, KCL, I think, is, is pretty intuitive. KVL, I think, is a little less intuitive sometimes, and people get confused by the polarity. So um, suppose we'll talk about this. So KVL is the sum of all voltage changes around a loop is zero, which is to say that if you start at a point and you know that point is ground, and then you go up a source, down a resistor, down a resistor, up another source, down a resistance, when you get back to that same point, the voltage has to you has to have gotten back to where you started because um, th these points are going to have the same voltage. So here I've added a couple of sources, and so we'll do KVL to try and figure out the voltage drop across this resistor. So there's different ways that you can do it. Um, usually, I like to go clockwise. Uh, it's arbitrary. You can do whichever you want. And a lot of times, I'll start with the bottom. So if we start here. And then here, here, here comes in like the, the biggest debate in all of electrical engineering is when we encounter this source, should we call this a plus five or a minus five? Well, the real answer is it doesn't matter as long as you say consistent. So the way that I always did it was opposite of what everyone else chose to do, which caused me a lot of problems. So we'll call this a minus. So we're here and then we say minus five volts. OK, because we're encountering this minus sign and it's a five volts. OK, we'll keep going. And then if we said minus to this one, then we should say which one to this plus or minus. Plus plus, right? We're encountering this plus sign, so we should say plus 20 volts. OK, let's keep going. And then what here? Minus 10 volts. And then we keep going. And let's say that this resistor is like this. We don't know for sure. But let's just say that it's going to drop like this. So we would say, we could say, we could play, say, we could call this VR14. Okay. We don't know the voltage drop there. That's what we're going to solve. But we would, we would add this plus VR14. Okay. Whatever that is, we need to solve for this. Equals zero. We've gotten back down to the node that we started at. Okay. Did everyone follow this process? Okay. So let me just double check on the, OK, everything going good online. You guys can hear everything OK. I think you can chat if you have any questions. Um, you can try speaking up, but I'm not sure if the audio is working. But uh, yeah, ch ch definitely chat if you have questions. OK, so let's simplify this out. We have minus 5 plus 20 minus 10. That comes out to what? 5? Positive 5? Yeah, so 5 volts plus V. R14 equals zero. So what does that mean? Negative five. So we subtract it over to the other side. VR14 equals negative five volts. So what that means is current is not actually flowing this way. Current is actually flowing this way, right? Yeah. Right. Okay, good question. So, um, okay. So, so with this method, what we did is we started going clockwise, and we said that this is a minus five volts, and then this is a plus twenty volts. So, it's kind of a function of which direction you choose to go, and whether you choose to say, "I'm going to count," oops, I'm going to count the first sign that I encounter or the second sign that I encounter. Okay. Um, but if we were to choose to do it a different way. So let's just choose one of those things. So we got the VR14 was negative five volts. What's important is we defined VR14 of being positive here, negative here. And the value is negative five. Yes, it was the two. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Is there a question? I don't think it's in that class. Yeah, it's like ECSN. Do you know Okay. <laughs> You know, what's funny about not being 70 years old is you know how to do things like that. <laughs> I've had professors before who don't know how to handle a, a Teams meeting. But 
So what we said is we said before we knew anything about the circuit, we said that it's going to be positive polarity here and negative polarity here. And we found that the answer was negative 5 volts. So what that means is in reality, it should be like this. And we should say that it's 5 volts, OK? These are equivalent. This polarity with a value of negative 5 is the same as positive 5 with the opposite polarity. So if you switch the polarity across something, then the sign of the voltage switches, OK? Yeah? I mean, like on the exam, she gives us a problem just like the one you have that doesn't say which way the resistor is. That's, I think that's what she Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so you're given this question, and if the question asks, what's the voltage across R14? Would that be how they phrase it? Yeah. I would say you should probably choose the positive answer. Because they don't specify polarity, now, I, now you're going to get me in trouble if I'm wrong, but it, it, it's tough because, yeah, it is a little ambiguous. But usually when, we set, when we're talking about the voltage across a resistor, we say, like, the voltage drop across it. The direction doesn't really matter, but you know that there's five volts across this resistor. Yeah? But you could find the direction by finding the equivalent voltage. Like, before the five volts, the current goes this way. And for 20 volts, the current goes the other way. So the, the total current would be going the other you're talking about like superposition, right? Like you're talking about finding the voltage or the current from each of these sources. No, no, no. You could just like combine all of the sources just to find the direction of the final current. Right. And that's essentially that's what we did. So we could have done this in two different steps. So we could have first found, ignore the resistor and combine these voltage sources. And that's where we would have gotten. Um, OK, well, let, let's pretend that we do that. OK. So we have a five volts here. So let's go, let's use the other notation. So let's call this, we're starting here, we're increasing by 5 volts, and then we're dropping by 20 volts, and then we're increasing by 10 volts. So as seen across this resistor, we could call this a, what is that, a negative 5 volt source, All right? So we could redraw the circuit, and we could do it in a couple of ways. Right? And this is R14. Now, writing, writing like this with this polarity and a negative value is a little unnatural. So what would typically be done is if this is actually the case, you'd write something like this. OK. Now, the question still stands is what is what does she want if if it just asks for the voltage across the resistor. Has it ever been the case where the negative value is correct? Yeah, it, it's sometimes e-learning is really weird. OK. Mm. We just hope and pray that that doesn't happen. I think yeah, she said I don't think that right. she gets up one answer. She's going to have to do something. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I feel like at that point, you could just dispute it. With I mean, her. she said, yeah, like she said, we're going to get partial credit. So if we get negative 5, we put a negative 5. Yeah. I'm just. So what I'm trying to think of is like, is there anything else that it could have said in the problem that would make sure that like, oh, maybe you didn't notice that it was but like this would tell you that it's got to be one way or the other. But I don't really know. Like, if you literally just give you a circuit and it's saying what is the yeah. voltage across resistor volts. Yeah. Then in that case, it really is ambiguous. Usually you'd want to put the positive answer, but I like I took these classes too, and I know that it's sometimes just the toss up. But at least Dr. Kogan is is like she, she'll help you out with those. I think. Like if, if you get it wrong, even though that it's right, you can probably argue or she'll give back points or something. So, um, but yeah, yeah, I think just do your best is my answer. Unfortunately, you're still using the uh, what is it with the the connect? Yeah, the connect online. Okay, yeah. Is anyone taking twenty three ten right now? Yeah, about half, maybe a little bit less. Okay, are you still using the uh, my books? Yeah, it's, it's really annoying. Okay. So I was like, yeah. Yeah. No, you're not going to encounter that too much in your other classes where you have like an online, like for calculus for 2310 and 1202, I had like an online homework thing. But after that, it's usually just like assigned questions from the book or something. So hopefully you can get through it. But yeah, that 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 comes up with the the polarity thing. Just do your best and make sure you can defend your answer if you uh, if you get it wrong. So another one is here. We're doing KVL and KCL. So 
in this question, we know that these are all in parallel, right? So we could do KVL and find the voltage across each of them. But you can just tell by looking at it that the voltage across all of them is 10 volts, right? So technically, if we had labeled the polarity, maybe we say it's like this and like this, and like this. It'd be a really silly thing to do because they're all in parallel. But technically, you could do it, OK? So if we're going clockwise, we say we have a negative 10 volts. And say we're doing this first loop. And then we have a plus VR4, OK, equals 0. That implies that VR4 is 10 volts, right? We add this over. So this is a 10 volts. If we set the polarity the other way, we can still do KVL and say negative 10, whoop, negative 10 volts, and then keep going around this other loop, and we'll say minus VR5 equals zero, okay? And what that would imply is VR5 is equal to negative 10, right? Um, and the, the reason that's okay, because we know they're in parallel, we know they have the same voltage drop, is just because of the way that we set the polarity. So I hope that you don't get confused by this. It is a little confusing, especially when they're ambiguous, but make sure you understand like the polarity can make the voltage seem negative even when it's not. Um, like if you have a battery and if you put that battery upside down and connect the same two terminals, you'll measure, measure a negative voltage as opposed to a positive voltage. It's just how you're measuring. Um, and we don't have to solve this out. We can come back to this one and do like the current and everything if we want later. But uh, I think we'll have uh, bigger fish to fry with the trig stuff. So voltage and current division, these are really important circuits, especially the voltage division one. You can always rederive them using KVL and KCL. But it's a, it's a really nice shortcut that will come up often. So we know that the if we have a circuit like this one, it really only makes sense when you're looking at a circuit. The output voltage between these two resistors is equal to the input voltage times the second resistor over the series pair. OK, so you've probably used this before, but let's calculate V out in this case. So V out is at this node. Um, how many nodes are there total in this circuit? Three nodes, right? There's A, B, and C. C is all of this, right? And a lot of times you'll see like one node is considered ground. But it's not really necessary in a circuit like this to specify that. So let's find the output voltage V. V out equals V in is 10 volts times, which one is R2 in this case? 12K or the 7K? 12K, yeah, yeah. 12K over 12K plus 7K, which is equal to 12. So what would this be? 10 volts times 12 over 19. Six point three, yeah, six point three two. Okay, so this is using a uh, voltage division in a simple case. What voltage division is really saying is that this is a special kind of for two for two resistors. The, yeah. R, say we said, say we're, say we're looking for R1. V R1 equals V supply times R1 over R1 plus R2, right? Yeah. What this formula is, it's just specifying that we're looking for it after it's across the second resistor instead of the first, right? Because they're asking for the second one. Yes, no, no, no. Very good point. So what you're saying is it's not just for the voltage, because what this is basically, it's it's not only the voltage at this node, it's really just the voltage across this resistor, right? Because if we if we say that this is ground, right, then this is zero volts at the bottom, and this is V out volts at the top. So V out minus zero is just V out. So the voltage across this resistor is just the voltage V out. So yeah, this equation is solving for the voltage across the second resistor. But yeah, that's a very good point. 
What voltage division is really saying is that voltage drops proportionally across resistors in series. So the voltage drop across the first resistor, so if we ignore everything that we did before, the voltage drop across the first resistor is basically R1 over the entire resistance, which in this case is, or let, let's just use the numbers. So um, 7K over 19K, we know that's the total resistance. This is some proportion. Because we're putting a resistor over the entire resistor, this is always going to be less than one, no matter which resistor we choose. Okay. And we're multiplying that by the total resistance of 10 volts. If we had three resistors, uh, okay, let's, let's, uh, I really like this discussion. So let's, let's take a second. If we had three resistors, bear with me for a sec. Okay, call it R1, R2, R3. We can, we can say that the proportion of the total resistance given by R1 is R1 over REQ, which is R1 over R1 plus R2 plus R3. This is a measure of what proportion of the entire, entire load is given by R1, okay? Let's say that this num number came out to something like 30%. Or 0.3 or something. If this resistor takes up 30% of the total load, it's going to get 30% of the total voltage. So we could say that the voltage across R1 is 30% of your voltage source. Okay, that's really what voltage division is saying in a deconstructed sense. It's not always just across the second resistor. It's because, yeah, and a lot of times what it is is. The voltage at the middle point between two resistors. So that's usually that's why that's the one we give because that's usually where it comes up. But really, you could use it for any any um, any set of series resistors. Make sure though that if, if two resistors are in parallel, like uh, like in this yeah in this example, we would need to collapse these two first, and then we could use this equivalent resistance. But no, that's a really good point about like the proportional drop across resistors, and this can save you some time if they ask you the voltage across R two. One thing you could do is collapse R1 and R3 and then do the simple voltage division, or you could use this formula. So the voltage across R2 equals Vs times R2 over R1 plus R2 plus R3. Because this represents the proportion of the load and you're multiplying by the source voltage. Okay, so that's the really cool thing about voltage division. Uh, does this make sense to everyone? Okay. Um, we can, so let's, let's do this. Yeah, so usually what we say is like, there's some output voltage here. And the reason that we would use voltage division is to step down a voltage maybe in some situations. There's other ways to do it, but if you have a 10 volt input voltage and you wanna get a certain output voltage, you can choose these resistors so that the proportions work out that your output voltage is what you want. So let's figure out this output voltage here. Um, first step is we need to collapse these two resistors. So let's call this one, R12. So what is R12? So we could do 100 times 250 over 100 plus 250. And that equals, anybody got it? I'm getting 71.4. OK, so we can redraw this circuit. And if we want the, the output voltage here, we would we would say that. Right, this is equivalent to saying what's the voltage drop across the 25 ohm resistor, and that would be. The source voltage times 25 over 25 plus 71.4. Which if we do some quick math, this bottom should be about 100. So this, this proportion is about 25%. So it should end up being about 25% of 10, which is about 2.5. That's what it should be about. So let's actually calculate this. 25 divided by 25 
75 plus 71.4 times 10 is 2.59. Okay. So you can kind of use a little bit of mental math sometimes to know, like if you have a small resistor and a big resistor, there's going to be more voltage across the big resistor. And that voltage is going to be proportional to the total resistance of that, uh, the, the, the proportion of the, the total resistance that resistor makes up. That's voltage division, okay? Any questions about voltage division? Okay, let's move on, let's move on. Current division is also, it's kind of the same thing, like it's the same idea, except kind of uh, reversed. So uh, the formula is like the opposite. So if we have a voltage or a current source here and we have two resistors like this, the current through resistor R1 is equal to R2 over R1 plus R2. Or it's equal to the equivalent resistance divided by the resistor in question. Um, so that kind of looks like it's not the same thing. It kind of looks like it's not just the flipped version of the voltage revision formula. But you can always recalculate this using Ohm's law, using uh, collapsing the resistor networks. So if you ever get a, a circuit like this that has multiple resistors in parallel and you want to find the current through one of them, you can find the equivalent resistance. Uh, use Ohm's law. So this is just Ohm's law. You're basically, once you've got it as equivalent resistance and your current source, then you can find the voltage by doing a uh, Voltage equals I S R E Q. And then once you have this voltage across this network of parallel resistors, then you know the voltage across each of them individually. It's all the same because they're in parallel. So then you can find the nth current by doing this voltage divided by the nth resistor. So um, th this will come up probably every once in a while. You'll be asked about something like this, but you can always, if you, if you, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, similarly, if you're using the original formula you showed us and say there's like four resistors in parallel and they ask for I, uh, I three, are you always going to use the resistor that comes before I three? Like over here, they're asking for I two and they use R one. Oh, I see what you're saying. Good question. Okay, so let's look at that real quick. So let's say that we have current source. And this is R1, R2, R3, R4. OK, so what you really have to do is. OK, the short answer is you use the equivalent resistance. So the, the general formula is for N resistors, it's this. The nth current is REQ divided by RN times your source voltage. And you can rederive that. It's basically combining the steps that I described into one formula. So you can imagine. Okay, wait, I'll, I'll scroll away for that one second. Um, so you find the equivalent resistance, and then you do V equals IS times R equivalent resistance. Okay. And then to find the nth current, you do V divided by RN. So essentially, you're doing source current times REQ divided by Rn equals In. OK, that, that's combining. So you find the equivalent resistance. That's Req. The total voltage across the entire network is your source voltage times the equivalent resistance, right? And once you have this voltage, you divide it by the nth resistor. But this voltage is just your source, volt, your source current times your equivalent resistance. So if we keep it like this, and we write it like this, sorry. IS times REQ over RN equals IN. That's this general equation up here. So it's not going to be the resistor before it. It's going to be this formula where you do the equivalent resistance divided by the resistor in question. So it's kind of like the inverse of the proportionality. In the, in the voltage division, it was RN divided by REQ. In this one, it's REQ divided by RN. The other difference is in this one, they're in parallel, and the other one, they were in series. but you shouldn't really have to memorize the formula like this. 
because current division comes up so little that you can just rederive it, do your collapse in that org. Does anyone have any questions about this? You can use this formula or you can just collapse the network, find the voltage, do voltage divided by resistance is current. Okay. We can come back to this if we have time. So let's let's move on to inductors and capacitors and, and phasers and everything. So I think this is the, the hardest part of this class. Um, and you guys have talked about inductors, capacitors, stuff like that, right? Okay. So inductors. Um, the unit is Henry or Henry's with an H. The energy stored in an inductor is one half L I squared. Combining them in series is just like resistors. Combining them in parallel is just like resistors. For series, you add them. In parallel, you add their reciprocals. OK, uh, the impedance of an inductor is J omega L. So um, impedance, right, it's kind of just like a abstract uh, abstraction of resistance in the complex plane. So resistors have impedance. The impedance of a resistor is just R. The impedance of an inductor is J omega L. OK, and once you're working with impedances, you can kind of treat things the same way. But th this this part of the class is I think where things get really tricky. So um, let me know if you have any questions, if I'm going too fast or anything. But in DC, which is direct current zero frequency, it's just a constant voltage level or constant current. Omega is zero. That's the frequency. Omega is the angular frequency, right? So in DC conditions, your angular frequency is zero. And so if we try to find the impedance of an inductor in DC conditions, we can plug it into the formula. J times the angular frequency is zero times L gives an impedance of zero. So in DC conditions, an inductor is just like a wire. You might have heard that before, right? OK, in DC conditions, an inductor is like a wire. Conversely, if we plug in a high frequency or as omega approaches infinity, we use this formula to find the impedance of an inductor in high frequency conditions. J times infinity times L approaches infinity. So that's like an open circuit. Infinite impedance is like an open circuit. Zero impedance is like a short circuit. Okay. Uh, so that's like the quick rundown on, on inductors. Uh, and we'll do capacitors quick and then we'll do some, some examples. So capacitors, units are farads. Energy store is one half C V squared. V is the voltage across it. In series, capacitors add like their inverses. And in parallel, they add like resistors in series. So, so capacitors are the ones that are just a little bit different. Um, don't get messed up on this. A lot of times in this class, you're not going to have to combine things like this in series and in parallel. There's just going to be like one resistor, one capacitor, one inductor. But make sure you know how to do these things. Um, and in your physics classes, you'll learn about like why it is that they combine this way. Uh, but that's not really important. Is anyone taking ENM right now? Physics 2326, I think it is. Yeah. OK, I think I took it like the semester after I took this class, so you're, uh, you're you're definitely on track. But capacitors combine in this way, it's the opposite of the inductors and the resistors. And the impedance of a capacitor is one over J omega C. And you guys have talked about complex numbers a bit, right? Have you ever seen them before this class? Yeah, okay. algebra two. Okay. And definitely you probably used I back then, right? So that, that's a that's a tricky one, but you know, just start getting used to using J. As long as you're not like a double major with math, you're not going to have any problems. <laughs> Unless your math you have to see your homework and they say, why are you using J? That's ugly. And then you tell them that I looks ugly. But in DC conditions, a capacitor has we can we can find out the uh, the impedance of a capacitor. So it's one over J omega C. If omega is zero in DC conditions, then that impedance approaches infinity. You have one over zero. So that's like an open circuit. And I always found this one to be a little bit more intuitive because the capacitor is parallel plates. There's no short connecting them. So if you try to send direct current through, it cannot go. There is no there is no path. There's literally a gap. So capacitors, that's kind of like you can imagine the physical and you can do the equation and you can remember that capacitor in DC conditions is an open circuit. The other way around in high frequency conditions as omega approaches infinity, you have one over J omega C. That turns into one over infinity goes towards zero. So in high frequency conditions, capacitors act like short circuits or wires. OK, these are important things to you can derive them every time, but it's after a certain point, it just gets easier to remember. Them, OK, 
So capacitors, inductors, um, definitely make things a little bit more tricky. So down here is a quick little, this is maybe a graph you've seen before. This is the complex plane. So the x-axis here is the real numbers. Um, and that's kind of like your resistances. Resistors have a real impedance. And inductors and capacitors have a, a complex or an imaginary impedance. We call it reactance. Um, and we usually use an X for that. Like X is like reactance. Um, but a lot of times you can just say Z for impedance. And that kind of is like an umbrella that covers resistances and reactances and all that. So you can just usually say um, Z for impedance. So if the imaginary part of your Z, of your total impedance, is positive, um, that's an inductive circuit. And if the imaginary part of your impedance is negative, that's capacitive, right? So uh, if you remember, the, the impedance of a capacitor is 1 over J omega C, right? The J is in the denominator, so we can rationalize it by going J over J, which is J over negative 1 times omega C, right? Maybe you guys have seen that before, but what that means is, which is equal to negative J over omega C. So sometimes it's nice to skip directly to this step when you're adding and subtracting impedances, because uh, that way the J is in the numerator. If you had to add it to an inductance, then you can just say, factor out the J and add the one over omega C part. But we'll get to an example of that in a bit. So, uh, but yeah, that's why capacitive is kind of like the negative imaginary impedance, because you have this negative one when you rationalize the denominator or you get rid of the J in the denominator. OK, so this might be useful. I can imagine that. Oh, sorry, you might get questions about a chart like this. Uh, have you seen something like this before? Yeah. OK, so like maybe they'll give you a circuit and then they'll ask you, is it overall capacitive or inductive or something? And then I ask you like leading or lagging. Have you guys done that? Yes. OK. So, yeah, Eli the Iceman. So, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, in, well, can anyone tell me, Eli the Iceman, if your circuit is inductive, if it's up here, what's going to happen between your voltage and your current? Voltage leads current. And so that's like the E stands for EMF, the I stands for current, and then this stands for inductive. And I always got confused because you could say voltage leads or current lags. And then for the other one, it's the other way around. So definitely Eli the Iceman will help you out. Has that everyone seen this before? OK, perfect. So um, yeah, I can imagine like that could be a multiple choice question or something where you they give you a circuit and you say, will the current lead or lag the voltage? And then you just have to make sure that you know exactly what they're asking. And then write down Eli and Ice on your paper to be sure. Um, OK. So here's a question that you might have seen something like this on your homework. Uh, it's an inductive circuit. It's an RL circuit. RL meaning resistor and inductor. And it gives you a current waveform over time. And it's going to ask you about the energy stored in the inductor at different points in time. And you could do a similar problem like this for a capacitor. And maybe you've seen this in your homework. Have you guys done questions like this before? Yeah, OK, yeah. So I'm pretty sure that like this exact kind of, kind of question is on the homework. So. You've probably done this before. We can run through it real quick, though. So we see from this current waveform, we have a, a, a D, an independent current source. So this thing is going to be gener generating current according to this equation. From negative infinity up until t equals 0, there is no current. So we know that there is no energy in the inductor, because we know the energy in an inductor is, what's the equation? Yeah, for, for a capacitor, yeah, it's one half C. So, so for a capacitor energy, one half C V squared. For an inductor, one half L I squared, right? OK, so before T equals 0, the energy is 0. From T equals 0 to T equals 7, the equation, uh, the current is I of t equals 2t, right? So if we look at the energy as a function of time in the inductor, that is 
one half L I squared. So one half L I of T squared, which is one half, the inductor is four Henry's, and I of T is two T squared. This gives us one half times four is two. And then two T squared is two T quantity squared is four T squared, which gives you eight T squared as the total uh, total energy. So the energy is going to change over time, of course. So at t equals seven, the energy stored in the inductor is whoops. Okay. At t equals seven, we can plug in seven to this equation. So the energy at t equals seven equals eight times seven squared, which is yes. Okay. So you're right. Right. But if you if you look at yeah, okay, that's a good point. Um, because this is continuous, it'll be because if you, if you were to plug in seven here, two times seven is fourteen, and twenty eight minus two times seven is also fourteen. It'll work out, but yes, that's a good point. So you probably wouldn't get so you'd probably get like like five or six or something, but as an exercise, if it was seven. Yeah, so at t equals seven, if we're just looking at the current, so the current at time equals seven, if we were to use this equation, it would be two times seven, which is 14 amps. If we were to use this equation, I of seven equals 28 minus two times seven, which is 28 minus 14, which is also 14 amps. So in this case, it works out because it's a continuous function. But uh, yeah, in general, be on the lookout for that. So uh, eight times times seven squared is 392. And what's the unit for energy? Joules, right? OK, from seven less than t less than 12 and this session will be recorded so you can always catch up on it later uh we have the current is 28 minus 2t so we know that the energy in the inductor is one half times four times 28 minus 2t quantity squared okay so that's again it's two times 28 squared minus two times 28 times 2t plus 4t squared, okay? So 28 squared is 784 minus four times 28 is 112. And we can multiply two out by all of this, but you get the idea. That's for between seven and 12. Yeah. I might have made a math mistake. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, here? So that comes from, yeah, sorry, this got to be a little bit of a mess. I didn't leave a lot of space, but so what we were solving for here is, at time equals seven. So this was assuming we're using this equation for between zero and seven. So let's just uh, let's just pretend that this was included because I basically took an example and I changed the numbers and I didn't think about that. So <laughs> forgive me. But uh, but so the energy stored in the capacitor between zero and seven seconds, we found that equation to be this. Eight T squared. So and we got there by saying between zero and seven. The current is 2t. And we know the energy as a function of current is 1 half Li squared. So we took the current equation and we plugged in here. So we got the energy as an inductor as a function of time equals 1 half Li squared. 1 half and L stay the same, but this current equation is given by 2t, 2 times t. So we plugged in 2 times t here, 
we solved it all out and we got 8t squared. Basically, 1 half times 4 times 2 squared is 8 times t squared. So between the, the times of, of 0 and 7, this equation will give you the energy stored in the inductor as a function of t. So at time equals 7, we plugged in 7 for t. And that's how we got the 8 times 7 squared. They only give us these equations that you're basing them on. Yeah, they should. They should give you, if they're going to give you a question like this, then yeah, they'll have to give you what the current is. Or if it's a capacitor, like you might see an equation that's like, uh, a question that's like a voltage source and a resistor and then a capacitor. And basically the, it's the same, it's the same exact problem where they give you the voltage as a function of time in some piecewise form. And then they'd ask you about the energy stored across the capacitor where energy in the capacitor as a function of time equals one half C V squared. Okay. So um we can we can move on past this one do you guys do you guys understand this example like there might be a question like this either inductors or capacitors on your exams okay but any other questions we can come back to this later too uh sinusoids and phasers so this one is kind of tricky because this is probably something you haven't seen had anyone seen these before this class yes okay some people had okay well that's very good so there's a lot of good resources online i linked one of them here that kind of explains basics there's a lot of good visualizations but basically um you're going to deal with a lot of sinusoidal functions in signal processing we like to break things down into simple sinusoidal functions because that makes processing easier um so you'll see that we can often describe a signal as having an amplitude or a magnitude a frequency and a phase shift so uh here is like the amplitude and here's the frequency and there's no phase shift that would be added here right but one thing that's important to note is there's a difference between the the magnitude or the amplitude of a function and then the peak to peak um of a function or if it's centered at zero the peak to peak is the top minus the bottom which is going to be two times the amplitude of the oscillation now you can imagine that it gets a little bit trickier say that your signal is biased somewhere Maybe say this is three volts and your signal swinging up like this. If you were to read the maximum voltage, this could be six volts. The minimum voltage would be, I guess I didn't draw this right, that'd be zero volts. Okay, so the peak to peak would be six volts. The maximum voltage would be six volts, but that's not half of each other. It's because it's biased at three volts. So this magnitude here is three volts but the peak to peak would be six. So if you're looking at from the middle of the sine wave up to the top, that's always gonna be like the amplitude of oscillation. And the peak to peak is always gonna be double the double of that if it's a pure sine wave, right? But the problem comes in is if it's not biased at zero, then your maximum voltage is not always going to be like your, your amplitude, right? Because here we saw that our amplitude is three, but the maximum voltage is six. So just be careful of that. And honestly, take a step back, look at it. Does it make sense? The peak to peak is actually just the peak to the peak, the, the max minus the min, okay? And in the middle of that is your bias condition. A lot of times it's gonna be zero, okay? And again, omega is your angular frequency. It's two pi times the frequency in Hertz. So sometimes the first step in a question is converting your frequency in Hertz into an angular frequency by multiplying by two pi. Um, any questions on this? OK, let's yeah, let's let's get on to the, some of the harder stuff. So sines and cosines, if you're converting between a sine and cosine. There's some formulas that you can remember that I always forget. And I always get confused by these. If you have a sine and you want to convert it to cosine or if you have a cosine, you can subtract 90 degrees and you'll get to sine. And if you have a cosine or if you have a sine, you add 90, that's equal to cosine. So uh, Sometimes it's confusing when you add and when you subtract. If you have a cosine, you've got a sine. But what I like to think about is just think about the unit circle and where where you're at. So you know that the sine of 90 degrees is one, and the cosine of 90 minus 90 is also one. So if you have a sine and you want to convert it to cosine, 
you'll you'll add this this minus 90 degree term in there. OK, and that's that's basically what these equations are saying. But for me, it helps to remember a specific example, something like, yeah. that if I have sine, I could add 90, that's going to give me cosine. But in reality, if I have sine, I should go, I should minus 90, and that would give me cosine. Like, I, like, like do you see, do you see yeah. what I'm saying? No, yeah, I definitely agree with you. And I get confused by it even to this day. Like, I still have to draw out an example like this. So, so for example, if you're given a, a function that's like sine of like 377t minus, uh, Let's let's do radians. Let's do let's do uh, pi over four. Okay, and if you want to convert this to a cosine, right? Uh, let me answer this. Piece. If you want to convert this to a cosine, basically, this is this is what we have here. We have sine of omega t plus an angle. So this is equal to cosine of 377t minus i over 4. OK, this is our omega t. This is our plus theta. That's equal to if we do minus 90 degrees, which is pi over 2. OK, so. Say we don't have these equations in front of us right now. How I would try to remember this is, OK, my sign is at. Right. Say that my sign had no phase shift and it was right here. At pi over two, OK? I know that the sine of pi over two is equal to the cosine of zero. So I can take my argument of the sine function and subtract pi over two to get the argument of my cosine function. That's that's how I go through it. Yeah. Show it what? Could you show us the unit circle? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. No, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I. No, good, good questions. So. OK, here's your circle. Right, so we know that this is zero or one comma zero. This is zero one, and this is this is a pi over four, and this point is root two over two, root two over two. Okay. Uh, this is the important bits. So when you're dealing with the unit circle, there's a whole lot. Basically, what this class is introducing you to and with this whole like trigonometry and circles and functions and everything is is all the same thing. And it takes a lot of like just experience to get comfortable with all of it, the phasers and the complex numbers and everything like that. So it definitely is a lot of math, this class. But what I would say for, for, what, for what I'm talking about here is to remember that the cosine is the x component of your point on the unit circle. So the cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. The cosine of 0 is 1, because 0 is the angle that we're making with the x-axis, and 1 is the x-coordinate of that, of that point of intersection on the circle. OK? If our angle is, oh, no, that was a bad idea. If our angle is pi over two, and we're right here, this is our this is our vector. The cosine is the x coordinate. The x coordinate of this is zero. So the cosine of pi over two is zero. Okay, and same thing. The sine is the y coordinate on your unit circle. So uh, say that we're another good one is say that we're here, our angle is pi over 3. This point is root 3 over 2. Exactly. So 
the cosine of this angle is the x coordinate here. So the sine of pi over three equals one half. Oh wait, no, it's cosine, cosine. The cosine of pi over three equals one half. That's the x coordinate. And the sine of pi over three equals square root of three over two. Okay, there's a lot of trigonometry required to understand some of the things in this trap in this class, but the two most important things that I was trying to make a point on is one zero and zero one. Those ones are pretty easy to remember. These two straight line bits. This is going to be recorded. So the cosine of zero degrees. If you're starting here, the angle here is zero. The cosine of zero is one because you're intersecting this point one zero. And the x coordinate is one. The sine of pi over two is also one. Because that's when you're straight up, you've got a length of one, and your sine is your y component. Okay. So if you have a function, a sine, a function of sine, so you have sine of 377t minus pi over four. You know that whatever sine angle you have, if you want to convert it to a cosine, so let's say we have sine of this angle. Well, let's say that that angle was pi over two. Let's say pi over two. If we wanted to convert it to a cosine, sine of pi over two is one. So how do we get the cosine? Well, we know cosine of zero is one. So how do we get from pi over two to zero? We subtract pi over two. So we could say that this is equal to the cosine of phi minus pi over two. So I don't know if that's actually helpful or if that makes things more confusing, but that's the way that I try to remember this transformation between sine and cosine. Just yeah, right, right. You add it, yeah. It's the same. It's the same kind of thing. So, and that's why these equations are a little misleading because you're like, where, which, which side am I on? Which side do I get to? But if you have a cosine. And you want to convert it to a sine, you'll take the argument of the cosine and add 90 to it, or add pi over 2. Okay? That's what these equations are saying. And if you really, if you sit down and think about it when you work with it more, you'll get more comfortable with things like the unit circle. But let's move on to some, some complex number stuff. So you guys have seen Euler's formula. E to the j times whatever x is cosine x plus j times sine of x. OK, so if you have some other numbers here, like you have a number out front. That gets multiplied both the sine and the cosine. If you have something else in the X here, that becomes the argument of your cosine and your sine functions. So 5 E to the J times 3 T becomes 5 all times cosine of 3 T times sine of 3 T. These are like your. Omega T. And this is like your um, your your magnitude of oscillation. OK. If it's negative. Then this uh, this J component becomes negative. OK, these are just some complex number things. Um, we'll get into some examples. Phasers. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Star Trek. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Star Trek. So a complex number, a phaser is, is a complex number that can represent a sinusoidal signal. So it's going to have an amplitude, a phase, and a phase shift at times. So say that this is our signal. This is a voltage generated by your voltage, your, your, your function generator. And you can describe it in this way, where you have your amplitude, your phase, and your frequency. OK? When we're using these phases, you've seen this notation before. You have the magnitude at an angle of some, some degree measure, right? You've seen this, so like, like 5 at an angle of 44 degrees. You, you've seen this notation before? OK, what this is saying is this is the magnitude of the oscillation. This is the phase shift. And there's nothing in here that says the frequency. And the reason is because usually in within a circuit, the signals are all of the same frequency. So it's, it's sufficient to write down this circuit is operating at a certain frequency. And then while you're working on the circuit, you can just use these two numbers to describe a signal. Because the frequency is going to be implied. OK, so. Using complex numbers, this this time domain signal that we have is really just the real 
the real projection of this complex number, this, this complex uh, a bit here. So it's the real part of this expansion of Euler's formula. So say that we had this e to the j omega t plus pi. We expand that into the cosine and the sine. We get a cosine of omega t plus the phase shift plus j sine of omega t plus the phase shift. And we're taking the real part of that, and that's just the cosine. So this is what we've been dealing with. But because now we're going to introduce inductors and capacitors, they have imaginary impedances. So they're going to have an effect on the imaginary portion of our signal. So what's important for this class is just understanding how to work with them. Um, so polar form is where you have the magnitude and the phase. So we're dealing with a, a 2D plane, right? And we're talking about the same point. So between these two examples, polar and rectangular, we're talking about the same point. We can describe that point as being an angle away from the x-axis at a certain distance. That's, that's the polar form way of saying it. We have an angle and a distance. And the rectangular form is we give it the x and the y-coordinates. You can see these are the same point. There are two ways of describing the exact same point, And you can convert between them using trig. So say that we wanted to convert this to polar. Um, how do we do that? Right. So yeah, we, we need to get the we need to get the R and we need to get the theta. The R is the the distance. So R equals the square root of five squared plus seven squared. Twenty five plus thirty five to the square root of sixty. OK. Theta equals and sometimes it. Wait, it doesn't have a sign. <laughs> good catch, good catch, good catch, good catch. is 74. OK, whatever it is, theta is you can always draw out the triangle. So 5 plus J7. If this is the imaginary axis and this is the real axis. This is. 5 here. 7 here. This is like 0.5 comma 7. OK, and what we're trying to find is the distance to the origin. We know that this is seven. This is five. That's just a triangle. And this is just the Pythagorean theorem. That's how we get this radius or this distance. So this distance here. Is the square root of. 74. The way that we get this angle is again a little bit more trig. So we have the opposite. We have the adjacent. So we can say that theta equals. The inverse tangent or the arctan of opposite over adjacent. 7 over 5. So we could write this same number as square root of 74 at an angle of. And if you bother to calculate that out, you'd get decimal numbers. OK. So being comfortable with moving between polar and rectangular is really important, especially when you're doing arithmetic on these things. So let's do 5 at an angle of pi over 6 into rectangular. So if we draw this out in the complex plane, we basically have our angle here is pi over 6, and the distance is pi. OK, so to get the x and the y coordinates, so that's the real and the imaginary portions, we have to use some trig. So the x coordinate or the real coordinate is r times the cosine of your theta. And the y or the imaginary is r times the sine of your angle. So if we're writing this in, rect in rectangular coordinates, we could say our x coordinate or our real coordinate is 5 times the cosine of pi over 6. Our y coordinates is 5 times the sine of pi over 6. And if you remember your unit circle, this is 5 times the square root of 3 over 2. This is 5 times 1 half. OK, so we could write this. We're, we're not done yet. We could write this number as, will this be 5 root 3 over 2 
plus j, because it's imaginary numbers, it's five halves. OK, this is the y coordinate. It's the x coordinate. X coordinate, y coordinate. It's really no different from a normal 2D coordinate system. It's just that we write it using imaginary numbers. Okay. So how do you guys feel about like polar versus rectangular and going back and forth? Pretty good about that? OK. Let's do an example, or let's talk about an example. So this is really what it's for, is dealing with these complex uh, elements. So like if you have capacitors and inductors, it's going to introduce some lag or some phase shift between your voltage and your current. And you can do this mathematically. So um, what's really nice about these components is that if you generalize everything to a complex impedance, then you can use the same formulas that you were using, the same Ohm's law, V equals IR, works in the complex plane too, V equals IC. If you've gotten your resistance into an impedance, then you can do V equals I times Z, to get your complex current if you have your complex voltage. So that's a really nice thing. So current and voltage sources will often have no phase shift. Usually when you get them, they're going to say something like this. Like this is your voltage source. And so you can say the magnitude at an angle of zero. OK, this is step one. When you get a problem like this, oftentimes you're going to get the voltage in a form that looks like this. Being able to extract the polar form from that is really important. That's step one. So you know that there's no plus or minus here, so the phase shift is zero degrees, and the magnitude is five, five at an angle of zero. You can find the impedances of the, your circuit components as phasors. You can get them in the complex plane by using your, your formulas for impedance of capacitors and inductors, and we'll do an example in a second. This is kind of the overview. And then you get your Z, and then you can divide using the polar form. So VA over Z, and you subtract your phase shifts. So let's let's do an example because we're getting a little low on time. So if you're given this circuit, and we want to find the current from the voltage source, then what we have to do is first we have to know the frequency that it's operating at so that we can find the impedance of each of the elements. So we've get we've been given the impedance or the, the frequency in hertz. So what we have to do first is get the angular frequency. And the formula there is 2 pi. Yeah. So omega here is going to be 2 pi times 60 on 20 pi. OK. Uh, and the amplitude here is 5 volts. So we can say that our voltage source is 5 at an angle of 0 degrees. OK. Now, how do we find the impedance of A resistor. What is just the resistor? It's just the resistor, right? So that's just 3.3 kiloohms. The impedance of the inductor, how do we find that? Yeah, yeah. So J omega L, which is J, our omega is what? 120 pi? Yeah. One micro. Does anyone know how much a micro is? 10 to the power negative six. Right. So this is going to be. We can just say that this is. OK, let's just say that that's what it is for right now. And our capacitor, so our capacitor, what's the equation for the impedance of a capacitor? OK, exactly. And when we. When we do the times j over j thing, this gets to be negative j over omega c, which is the same thing as saying minus j times 1 over omega c. OK, and the reason I do it this way is the inductor is nice because it's j times this whole business. Here we have minus j times this whole business. So when we're adding them, subtracting them, it can be kind of nice to work with them this way. But we'll get there when we get there. OK. You will. No, you will get the right answer. It's it's all equivalent. It's just sometimes if you need to add these two quantities together, if you need to add 
j omega l plus one over j omega c. You first need to make sure that the j's are both on the top. But we'll see if we need to add them or not first. So uh, let's say this is negative j over omega, which is 120 pi. And what is c? 12 nano. What is, what is nano? 10 to the negative 9. OK. So we've, we can calculate these all out, but how do we actually get the equivalent impedance as seen by this voltage source? These are combined in parallel. So how do we add components in parallel? Yeah, so let's let's first. This is our voltage source. It's going to be some sine wave. And let's just draw boxes for impedances. OK, we're abstracting away the components. This is the R, the L, the C. And it really doesn't matter what they are. If we're dealing with impedances, then we can treat them all like resistors. OK, the equivalent impedance. The equivalent impedance is going to be the, the parallel combination of these, which is 1 over 1 over ZR plus 1 over ZL plus 1 over ZC, right? This is just using that parallel resistor formula, where I've swapped it 1 over ZEQ equals 1 over right? And then I've just swapped it again. So this is often how I'll skip that first step of swapping it. But this is our equivalent impedance. OK, so if we get this equivalent impedance, then we can do Vs divided by ZEQ gives us our current. Right. So we need to get the equivalent impedance. And calculating that is sometimes kind of a beast, but. One over ZR was 3.3K. ZL was J times 125 times 10 to negative 6. And ZC was, this is where it's sometimes nice to not flip it. Yeah. Polar form, and then do the reciprocal, and then um, what should we call it? Do and so you have to convert. So you have to convert to each individual one to polar, so you can take your reciprocal, and then convert back to rectangular, so you can add them, and then convert back to polar, so you can take your reciprocal again. You can. That is a lot of work, though. In a in a question like this, where they're all in parallel, what I would recommend is to do this. So. Before, like I didn't solve these all out because I don't know what's convenient yet. So what I like to do is get the equivalent impedance formula. So I'm just writing it all out. So ZC would be, um, in fact, if it's one over ZC, right? One over ZC, and ZC already kind of looks like one over something. Then we can say that one over ZC equals J omega C, right? OK. So down here, when we're writing 1 over ZC, we can just say J. Times 120 pi times our capacitor, which was 12 nano or 12 times. Send to the neighbor ninth. OK. So at this point, what I would do. Is combine all of these together. So you can you can turn this. You don't have to get this into polar form to do the division because we can do the J over J trick. If we multiply this one by J over J, then we get this is one over one over three point three K. J on top, J on bottom becomes minus one. So this basically becomes minus J over. You see how that one works? Yeah, OK. So this, this is how I recommend it. Get all of your J's on top. J 120 pi, 12 times 10 to the negative 9. OK, now you can just simply add these two together. Because they're both, they both got J's on the top. So you can basically factor out the J and you have 1 over 1 over 3.3K 3 .3 minus J 
times 1 over 20 pi times 10 to the negative 6. And then we factor out a minus, so this would be minus 120 pi Okay. Does everyone see how I've gotten here? Yeah. Okay. So now we basically have, it kind of looks messy, but if you type these into your calculator, it's just a single number, right? You have 1 over 3.3K, that's a number. And then you have all of this, which is another number. What you have here is, and let, let's let's type this out just, just to get some. Uh, the 1 divided by, one divided by, by 3.3K. This is... 3.03 times 10 to the negative fourth minus j times one twenty pi times ten to the negative six. This one is two six five three. And this one is 125 times 12 times 10 to the negative 9. OK, so these two we can we can subtract them. This one is is basically zero. But we can say 2652. Minus. Answer and we get that this is about Two six five one point nine nine. Okay, so there's a whole lot of math in there, but if you use your calculator, which I think you're allowed your calculator, it's fine. Basically, the idea is to get it into a single, uh, single rectangular form number before you do any of the polar business. Yeah. So the x would be the reciprocal of one upon what you did just now, or, or yeah. So the, the way that we set it up, this, our equivalent impedance is going to be whatever this evaluates to, which is one over all of this. So let's just write this here. The EQ equals all of this. So we this isn't really useful now because the J is in the denominator. But if we turn this into polar, well, then we can do the reciprocal very easy. And then we have our answer. So what I would say is, is focus on this guy and turn him into polar coordinates. So we would do uh, the polar coordinates. We do, um, yeah, this is your R, and your theta equals inverse tangent of y over x, right? So now I can tell you, these, these numbers work out that it becomes a very, very capacitive circuit, because you can see this is times 10 to the negative fourth, and this is 2,600. So, but let's, let's still solve it out. So if we type this in, 2652 squared plus 310 to the negative fourth squared. We basically get 2652, okay? And our theta, is going to be the inverse tangent of y over x. This is a negative 2652. 2652 divided by 3.03 times 10 to the negative fourth. OK, which is negative 89.9 degrees. So. We have our R, we have our theta. So Z EQ equals one over 2652 at an angle of negative 89.9 degrees. So when we take the reciprocal of something, or we could even think of this as saying one at an angle of zero degrees divided by 2652 at an angle of negative 89.9 degrees. When we divide two numbers in, in polar form, yeah. The answer is one over twenty six fifty two. Your radius is the is the the ratio of the radii, and you do your angle is zero minus negative eighty nine point nine, which gives you, of course, 
for an angle of positive 89.9 degrees. Okay. So this is your equivalent impedance. We had from the beginning that our voltage source was five at an angle of zero. Okay. This is the EQ. Your voltage source is five at an angle of zero degrees. So to find the current, we just use Ohm's law. So we can say Vs over ZEQ is the current, which is five at an angle of zero degrees divided by one over 2652 at an angle of 89.9 degrees. Oops. And if you solve this out, this will be, let's say, five times 652. Okay, so that's a lot of voltage because of the frequency enabling it to be like a kind of a short circuit. But in general, this will be uh, this will be the process to do these. And working with the complex numbers, like definitely go through some examples. Yes. Yeah, exactly. If this was a series circuit, right? Because in this in this case, they all have the same voltage drop. But yeah, if it was RLC in series, you could use the same voltage division equation where you have that proportionality where you say like if you have RLC, then you could get ZR, ZL, ZC. Just treat them like resistors. If you want the voltage drop across the inductor, the voltage across the inductor, you could do ZL over ZL plus ZR plus CZ times your voltage source. And then that would be, you'd have um, a phaser on the bottom, a phaser on the top and multiplying by a phaser. And when you multiply phasers, right? So imagine we had this, say that the, the ZL over ZR plus ZL plus ZC came out to be something like, like 12 at an angle of pi over six, okay? And we'd be doing this, times your voltage source. And let's say our voltage source is um, six at an angle of zero degrees. So when we're multiplying these two, 12 at an angle of pi over six times six at an angle of zero, we multiply their uh, radii, their distances to so six times 12 at an angle of, and then we add their phases, pi over six, plus zero. This would be 72 at an angle of pi over six, okay? Not a great example, but that's how you do the phasor multiplication. Um, yeah, we're a little over on time. I'm sorry about that. I wanted to get to more examples, but um, you guys have seen questions like this before, right? Like on the homework? Oops. Here we go. Can you explore the question? Yes. The impedance we got, the final impedance, one upon two, six, five, two, at 89.9 degree. Yeah. So once we convert this to the tangled form, that's how we get R plus Jx for the circuit. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's the equivalent impedance. Um, I might have made like a calculation mistake, but the process is all there. Just try and keep track of your, your numbers. And when you're doing division and multiplication, it's nice to be in polar form. When you're doing adding and subtraction, it's nice to be in rectangular form. And that's why, that's why, uh, in this step, we kept it in rectangular form so that we could combine these two terms into a singular rectangular. And then we converted it to polar to do this division. But yeah, you're right. Once once we had the equivalent impedance, if we had turned this back into a rectangular form, that would be the, the resistance of the circuit and the impedance of the, or the, the reactance of the circuit. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions about anything from today? We didn't really have time to go over a, a good uh, series question. The last question he just asked was what? The last question he had asked is once we had this impedance, as in this is in polar form, we could convert that back to rectangular form and it'd be the same thing. That would still be the impedance of the circuit. It'd just be in rectangular form. And it, it's the same thing, really. It's just sometimes it's more useful for it to be in polar form if we're going to be dividing. And usually when you have the equivalent impedance, you're doing that so that you can do this 
this division for the current. So like doing this division is a lot easier when this is in polar form, because then we can just divide these two and subtract the angles. If it's in rectangular form, then we have to convert it to polar form and before we can do that. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, sorry. I, I feel like we I, we didn't get through as many examples, but there's some really good questions. Can take a picture? Yeah, sure. You guys need a selfie for your class? Yeah, go my class. Yeah, it should be probably fine. Uh, I don't know exactly what they require, but you should be fine. You were here. I could vouch for you. Um, I think. Any other questions from online? This this will be uh, this recording will be uploaded to the YouTube channel so you can go back and review it. Um, if you want the notes, I can send them out. They're not the neatest. I could probably find a, a better set of notes, but. Very helpful thing. Awesome. Yeah, you know, perfect. I hope that this was helpful. I hope that you got some more practice or at least a little bit more exposure. Um, definitely, I'd say like like the question that you're looking at with the RLC in parallel, like, yeah. like being able to do that is really important because it's both working with the complex numbers and understanding how things work in parallel on series. That was a particular question, but I think you find a capacitor. Capacitor? Yeah. So all of my whole work was so to the capacitor shift to what is what's happening. Well, was it about that the energy in the capacitor? No, it's like uh, the equivalence capacitors or something. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, it's just the one that's like weird and like the lines connect weirdly. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I did that. I think I did that one. It's, it, yeah, it's, you have to pull them up. It's on here? No, uh, you know the one that had a weird, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't rectangles, it was curvy. It was like, I don't think we did that. Try, try to go back. Let me see. Go Keep going. Oh, it was like, it was like weird. It had like curves. I have a picture, but I can show you what I did. Okay. No, uh, it looked no. like. You know, we have different questions. Uh, so yeah. I have my like. Hey, wait, but it looked like this, right? 